from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Celebrating National Ag Day. But unfortunately, most Americans have no idea what happens behind the scenes. Hear from this year's video essay winner about what you need to know about agriculture. A potential new cash crop. Who would have ever thought, Ty, that oil companies would have been in the seed business? This is big oil joins big ag. See the latest big push for renewable diesel as oil prices move back down. Well, for right now, it actually looks quite favorable. What that means for farmers ahead of spring planting right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Oil prices continuing to fall right now. In fact, they're trading at their lowest level since the end of 2021. Last week, oil prices fell 10%, the worst weekly decline since April of 2020. So what does that mean for gas prices? Well, AAA reporting the average price for a gallon of gas right now is 344. That's down about three cents from last week. Diesel stands at 428, down about six cents from the previous week. So will prices continue to fall ahead of planting? Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us with more. Clinton, it's hopefully good news for farmers heading into planting. April futures of West Texas Intermediate crude oil traded as low as 64.21 per barrel on Monday before bouncing, which was nearly $40 off the high set May 6, 2022 at $103.21. Now, these are 16-month lows and have come as a result of the banking crisis and macroeconomic concerns that have spilled over into the equity sector. However, energy experts say global production has increased and is now exceeding demand as Russia has been able to keep production fairly hot. Plus, U.S. oil production has also rebounded post-COVID. So stocks have been building at about a million barrels per day, which could continue until the third or fourth quarter. And that's good news for consumers at the pump. Well, for right now, it actually looks quite favorable. U.S. gasoline uh, production is high and prices are, are continue to be soft. Um, underneath it, when you look at the, the dynamics for refiners, it's still quite profitable. So they're running full steam. Diesel fuel prices have also corrected from record highs at a national average of 425 last week. And Wenzel says the shortage last fall has been solved through increased refining capacity. We've seen in the U.S., uh, ExxonMobil put on 250,000 barrels per day of new capacity, primarily diesel, in its Beaumont facility. And globally, there's several other refinery projects that have come online um, it, for quite a bit of capacity. So there's 3 million barrels per day of new uh, oil refining capacity globally, and that's substantial. Wenzel says refining capacity will exceed global demand by nearly a million barrels. So they expect diesel fuel prices to be less volatile this spring as a result. That's good news for farmers and truckers and will help lower transportation costs, which will trickle down to consumers. Now with the lower diesel fuel prices, Wenzel says farmers can get some inventory secured if they need it. However, he says there's no rush to buy until the banking crisis gets ironed out and we see what the Fed response is. All right, thanks, Michelle. Lately, we've brought you updates on big oil joining with agriculture to use oil seed crops for renewable diesel. Now, there's a push to try cover crops as a new feedstock. Farm Journal's Stein Morgan has more on this potential cash crop. Renewable diesel is revving up interest from both agriculture and the oil industry. There seems to be no, no holding back this investment in renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. I'll put it that way. A growing industry that's painting optimism within agriculture is also one that saw a potential setback in December. We were extremely disappointed in the uh, renewable volume obligations that have been announced for biodiesel, renewable diesel uh, for 23 through 25. It basically uh, flatlines our industry over the next several years. It doesn't take into account the significant growth that's happening in the soybean crush sector. S&P Global Commodity Insights forecast crush capacity in the U.S. to grow by 25 percent in just a couple years. And the first major U.S. plant to produce renewable diesel is set to come online yet this month. There's an enormous plant out in Martinez, uh, California, yeah. which is um, a marathon plant that is is going to be running in the first quarter and then running full bore by by the fourth quarter. Meyer says that's the plant everyone is watching. See, that's a joint venture between Marathon and Nestea. 
We're, we're tracking used cooking oil imports into the U.S. very closely. They have increased quite a bit. That would be the preferred feedstock for that plant. Whether or not they have enough, that's the question. Soybeans will still be the main source for other renewable diesel plants coming online. But with not enough soybean acres to meet that demand, companies are also looking at other crops. Camelina certainly is going to be a source. And, and now uh, winter rapeseed or winter canola, if you, if you prefer, uh, is going to be a source. Just this week, Corteva, Bungie and Chevron announced a commercial collaboration to introduce a proprietary winter canola hybrid that would produce plant-based oil with a lower carbon profile. The goal, increase availability of vegetable oil to fuel the domestic renewable fuels market. Corteva's announcement comes on the heels of a joint venture between Shell Oil and SNW Seeds to grow Camelina. It's called Vision Biofuels and uh, it's uh, owned by both Shell and SNW Seeds. So we formed a separate joint venture. Uh, they're gonna be doing uh, breeding and research and actually at one of our former facilities in Nampa, Idaho. Who would have ever thought, Tyne, that oil companies would have been in the seed business. This is big oil joins big ag. A new partnership that's also planting new opportunities for farmers. They planted 10,000 acres of, of, of Pennycrest this year. They're looking for 20 million acres. 20 million is their, is their target within the next five years. That's why Meyer encourages all farmers to keep an open mind to those opportunities that could arise in the months and even years ahead. This is the opportunity, not necessarily for you to have to change your change your rotation or whatever, but the fact of the matter is this is an opportunity for you to make more money on your land if you pay attention to what's going on around you. The West Coast is preparing for yet another rainmaker. Meteorologist Chuck Hebert joins us with an update on that. Well, the fire hose continues out to the west. There is still copious amounts of water being sprayed on California, and that's in the form of rain along the coast and then more snow up in the mountains. And then working the way off to the east, we have a disturbance through the Memphis area that'll put some rain down on Wednesday. And Wednesday night into Thursday, more rain for the Chicago land area. And a clap of thunder, not out of the question, higher amounts of rain on Thursday throughout the day in the Midwest. But take a look at this in Kirkwood, California. Kirkwood Mountain Resort in the Sierras. They posted this picture on Facebook saying the snow has been relentless. They say they're getting asked if there's too much snow. But they say the answer is no. And they also say the crews have been relentless in digging out huge areas under the list to keep things going. Okay, I'll have your forecast coming up. A new Waters of the U.S. rule is now in effect. As we've been reporting, the new rule would replace one created during the Trump administration. It would expand federal protections for certain bodies of water. That rule would exclude certain types of ditches, ephemeral streams that only flow in response to precipitation and groundwater. However, the rule is likely to face legal challenges from industry groups and some states. And we are also still waiting on a ruling from the Supreme Court, which is expected by June. Now, a U.S. District Court did halt that rule in Texas and Idaho. Russia and Ukraine have agreed to extend the Black Sea grain deal. Reuters reporting the deal was extended for 60 days, which was half the intended period. Now, Russia said it decided to limit the extension over what it called, quote, a lack of progress on normalization of domestic ag exports. It says if the deal is renewed again in May, it would depend on certain conditions, including a resumption of farm machinery supplies and an unblocking of foreign assets and accounts held by Russian ag companies. Russian President Putin said if its conditions were not met, world leaders shouldn't worry about a food crisis in Africa. Moscow would send free grain to African countries in need. Soybeans standing up to selling pressure on Monday. We'll have details about what to expect in the week ahead coming up next. And later, while every day is Ag Day right here, there's also a national Ag Day to celebrate America's farmers and ranchers and fiber producers. Details in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Maristem Crop Performance. Learn how to get more bushels for less at maristemag.com. Last week it was corn, on Monday it was soybeans. Turn to shine, Michelle Rook is back to talk about the latest moves with Alan Brugler. And markets were mostly lower on Monday with the exception of soybeans and Alan Brugler is joining us. And Alan, 
Still that risk aversion risk off uh, kind of dominating the commodity sector. Yeah, that's definitely uh, the issue here. You, you've got the banking situation, you've got the Fed meeting, and uh, a lot of uncertainty about what the Fed's going to do because of, of what's been going on with the bank bailouts. You know, will they, will they raise rates another quarter percent or are they just going to stand pat? Uh, you know, we've got inflation, but we've also got the, the signs that maybe the, the, the rate hikes are causing the, the bank problems. So, uh, you know, I think we're, we're taking money off the table. And we also know that uh, some investors took a bit major haircuts on these bank failures. Uh, there's $17 billion of the bonds in Credit Suisse that'll be go written off to zero. Well, that's going to cause somebody somewhere to move some money around. Right. So we do know, like you say, money flow, the fund positions, that's all dominant in the trade here the last week or a couple of weeks in the commodities. Will that continue through Wednesday? And then what will change it after that? Well, you know, you always wonder if there's another shoe to drop. Is there another another bank that uh, hasn't been adequately covered or that, uh, you know, surprises the market? But, yeah, I think that once the Fed gives us a clear signal where they're at, we, we can start to focus more on the planning intentions report and grain stocks report, which are coming out the following week, start to worry a little bit more about growing season weather here in the U.S., those types of things. And then corn and wheat probably under a little pressure with the Black Sea grain deal extended, but soybeans were able to divorce themselves. And was that just a technical bounce or what? It, it looks like it's mostly technical. We went down to some of the retracement supports. Uh, we, we did some bad technical things last week, breaking speed lines and, and so forth. But uh, we, we hit alternate support levels today. The dollar was a little weaker uh, to, to kind of encourage uh, some buying there. And beans aren't nearly as exposed to the, to the uh, grain corridor as, as what the corn and wheat are. So you saw wheat sell off. It kind of dragged the corn down, but bean, beans were able to be independent. Okay, we'll see where we go from here. Thanks so much. Alan Brugler with Brugler Marketing. And you can get our full discussion at agweb.com. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. Ag Day is sponsored by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels, perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order 12 to 16 rows today and qualify for free shipping or 20% off an end zone moisture management package. I'll just Chuck Heaver joining us here with our national forecast and Chuck I know yesterday we had the arrival of spring but boy we had some cooler temperatures down in the southeast and then the storms just keep coming out in California. Yeah there were freeze warnings down in the southeast and still California unbelievable I think we're on like 12 or 13 of these pineapple expresses and here we go again let's take a look while it's obvious with the jet stream you can see we have a zonal pattern and what that means is most of the country is going to be relatively mild to start the week with that we will have a couple lobes of cold air pull down in terms of a trough and work their way across the country but most of the cold air will remain bottled up to the north northern states and into southern Canada you can see the cold air still up here we'll continue to see rain on the west coast and we'll see rain along a frontal boundary that'll set up down in the southeast. Right now, as it looks, well, the country's actually doing pretty good, except right down the center where we continue to have dry conditions throughout the center part of the country. But here along this boundary, especially like Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, and into Friday, where that storm sets up, we're going to get a lot of rain that'll pile up there and give us two, three inches of rain. Definitely not out of the question in southern Illinois and southern Indiana. In terms of the snow, that'll retain out in the mountains mountain west and then work its way again up into the colder air as that storm again moves across the country. But that's going to be the bigger story. Right now we're dealing with more rain on the west coast. Can you believe this? I think we're on number 12 in terms of the pineapple expresses that continue to plague the west coast and then mountain snows. Down in the center part of the country, some storms will fire up just to the uh, east of Memphis and then in the Chicagoland area Wednesday and into Thursday, another storm system will push there, not out of the question to a clap of thunder through there as well. All right, let's talk about 
Well, temperatures, there we go. 54 degrees in Chicago today, 81 all the way down in Brownsville, Texas, 51 in Salt Lake City. Taking a look at lows tonight, well, even down in Florida. Come on, it's pretty mild in Miami, 70 degrees, but much colder again up along the border. Bismarck at 10 degrees for the low. Here are temperatures for tomorrow. 80s going all the way up to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Wow, what an incredible ride, but mild throughout most of the country. Here's a look closer to home. Ridgeway, Montana, 30 degrees and 17, some snow showers. Wilmington, Delaware, sunny, high 60, low 38. And Santa Fe, New Mexico, so beautiful out there. Rain and snow, high 44, low 37. Ag Day is brought to you by Lamar's Toy Store, the largest and most diversified farm toy store in the U.S. They have new and old and do restorations and customizations too. You need to see it to believe it. Visit LamarsToyStore.com or call us at 712-546-4305. Growth in the number of anaerobic digesters is back on the rise, according to the latest data from USDA. The Economic Research Service releasing this chart showing that as of 2021, there are a total of 322 on-farm systems. An anaerobic digester is an airtight vessel in which bacteria digest or decompose organic waste, such as manure, and the resulting biogas can then be used to generate electricity or sold. Now, roughly 78% of all of these facilities in the U.S. are found on dairy farms, especially in California, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. A new dairy processing plant is being built in Idaho. Suntato breaking ground on what it says will be a state-of-the-art shelf-stable milk and alternative beverage facility in Burley. It says it's scheduled to open in the spring of next year. It says when complete, the facility will process up to a million pounds of local milk per day. Idaho is the third largest dairy producing state with 376 dairies and nearly 700,000 cows and 19 dairy processing facilities. Up next, celebrating American agriculture. It's National Ag Day and we'll meet the winner of this year's video essay contest next in the country. The 2023 Bracket Busters Challenge, presented by Case IH, is underway. Who's still in the game? To find out, head to AgWeb now through April 3rd to check the leaderboard. In the Country on Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. What if you had the nitrogen you need already on seed? Pivot Bio is the first company to apply nitrogen on seed. The nitrogen you need now on seed from Pivot Bio. Learn more at pivotbio.com. It's National Ag Day today. The Agriculture Council of America launching the program back in 1973. And the goal was to help every American understand how food and fiber products are produced and the role that ag plays in providing safe and affordable goods. Now, as part of that, every year the organization selects a video essay from a student. This year's winner is Olivia Lee from Aliso Viejo, California. So allow me to introduce you to food value chains. For context, value chains describe a relationship surrounding a product, while supply chains, the term you're probably more familiar with, describe the transaction of raw materials in order to produce the product. Supply chains are a little bit more cutthroat. Food value chains are strategic alliances between farmers and supply chain partners built on a shared mission to make sure that everyone benefits. Not just in economic ways, but in social and environmental ways. Say, for example, everybody in a grossly oversimplified food supply chain was interested in sustainability. They would then form a value chain surrounding the mission of sustainability. Farmers could switch to techniques like no-till or rotational grazing to improve their soil health and make sure that their land is protected for generations to come. They could also install sensors and other informational technologies to optimize resource use and reduce waste. Both ecological and technological solutions can help keep food prices down and reduce the negative impact on the environment. Agricultural companies can improve the economies of the communities that they operate in 
through tax revenue and increased wages. If workers are invested in and well taken care of, they'll stay within the agricultural industry and keep our country running. And with that, kids will grow up with better nutrition and less health issues as adults because during their childhood, fresh produce was affordable and accessible. I mean, literally take a look at this graph. There are so many things on this graph that I can't even begin to explain everything. Though I do hope that this little glimpse into the agricultural world piqued your interest a little bit and brought a greater appreciation for the food that we have. And if you're a student like me, consider studying agriculture so that we can keep having food on our tables. Happy Ag Day 2023! Congratulations to Olivia! And there was also a written essay contest that was won by Timothy Hill of Orlando, Florida. To read it, head over to agday.org. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Closed captioning on Ag Day is brought to you by BASF, helping you do the biggest job on earth.